Hey, Mr. P here. This video is all about the evolution of eukaryotes. So we're going to talk through the endosymbiotic theory. We're going to talk about what are the structural adaptations that our energy organelles, uh, specifically the mitochondria and chloroplast, have, and why they have those structural adaptations, um, how those structural adaptations are believed to have arisen, um, talk about kind of a timeline of events so that we kind of understand how or more easily understand how the endosymbiotic theory came about. Uh, again, this is going to be a really short video, so let's go. What is the endosymbiotic theory? The endosymbiotic theory is a theory that uses symbiosis as a means of explanation for how prokaryotes, ancestral speaking, okay, ancestral prokaryotes, evolved to produce the first eukaryotic cells roughly 2.5 billion years ago okay now evolution helps to explain how things specifically living things change once they are produced and and this is not an evolution discussion we're not going to go into natural selection and how uh, evolution is driven we're just going to use the fact that organisms change over time and adaptations happen as a means of discussion or a means of explanation for how we believe early prokaryotes became the first eukaryotic single-celled organisms. Once the eukaryotes kind of arose, then all of a sudden we can start to get more complex and it leads to multicellularity, which is really important when we you know, start talking about how the first living multicellular organism came to be on the planet. Again, not an evolution discussion. We're not going to focus on that. We're just going to focus on how this particular timeline progressed in order to get our first eukaryotes uh, roughly 2.5 billion years ago. So I mentioned that the symbiosis is the base process that the endosymbiotic theory is based on. And it helps to explain, like I said, how the first eukaryotes arose from uh, early prokaryotes. Now, how does it happen? Larger bacteria, okay, specifically larger prokaryotes at the time, roughly 3.5 to 4 billion years ago, started enfolding or started folding, started bringing in their plasma membrane. And what did that do? It actually creates the precursors to internal structures. If you progress this on you will see that if we enfold or pinch in our membrane enough it actually kind of forms a structure that has two membranes that basically makes the nucleus now if you remember from the last video we talked about the nucleus in a eukaryote is surrounded by a nuclear envelope which is two membranes thick okay or two membranes in its structure and so if we bring in these uh, or pinch in these little vesicles, these little bits of membrane, you will see that it actually creates not one, but two membranes that will eventually become what is the nuclear envelope, which will give rise to a structure inside of the nuclear envelope, which is where all of the DNA is kept. Obviously, prokaryotes had DNA. All the DNA is found here. This early precursor to the membrane creates a boundary between the inside and outside of where that DNA is kept, obviously giving rise to a nucleus. If we use endocytosis, which is a way of bringing in large bulky materials, and we progress kind of past the evolution of a nucleus and the evolution of even more enfolding, which will become what we now call the uh, organelles, um, if you recall, the endoplasmic reticulum is a very intricate set of internal flattened membranes, which are called cisternae. Again, we discussed that in the last video. Um, all that was done in order to produce what would become the endoplasmic reticulum was to just continue to pull in or fold in the membrane, which gives rise to all of those kind of layered folded sacs. Uh, again, giving it its own function, it would become the endoplasmic reticulum. So... Uh, fast forward a little bit more, right? We now get to a point where we have these internal structures called organelles. We now have kind of this precursor to the nucleus. We have all of our DNA inside. And now we have these aerobically respiring bacteria, smaller prokaryotes, that are going to be brought in by endocytosis, okay? 
endocytosis, which is a form of bulk transport used to bring in large materials. These mitochondria, or precursors to mitochondria, what would become the mitochondria, were brought in by endocytosis. Because they were brought in by endocytosis, they had their one prokaryotic external cell membrane, like all prokaryotes do, they would have been surrounded by or packaged into a vesicle when that was brought in. And so as we get into our evidence, um, you will see that the mitochondria and chloroplasts actually have two membranes. Now, I'm not going to jump down and go through all the evidence at this point, but it is important to note how did or why is it significant that the mitochondria have two membranes? Well, we need to kind of use the idea that they have two membranes to help kind of strengthen the idea that endosymbiotic theory is probably true, right? These early prokaryotes pinched in, brought a, a, a bit of the kind of what would become the eukaryotic membrane with it, and again, has two membranes as the result of it. So now they're inside. Now it is fully a symbiotic relationship which, remember, is a form of interaction in which both organisms, in this case both cells, benefit. Obviously, this cell benefits because it is given a host cell to live in. It is going to be kept safe. It's going to have a constant supply of nutrients and minerals. And the bigger cell is going to benefit because this little bacteria is constantly producing energy, which the bigger cell can use. Okay, so what is the difference between mitochondria and chloroplasts? Mitochondria are our aerobic respirers, meaning they're going to use oxygen and glucose, which would be readily available inside this cell to produce ATP. Uh, the chloroplasts are significant because these would have been photosynthetic prokaryotes. They would have been able to photosynthesize using sunlight in order to produce glucose. Those pinched in as well, obviously producing kind of a free living entity within this larger eukaryotic cell. Again, supplying the larger eukaryotic cell with energy, the larger cell supplying these little photosynthetic bacteria with a place to live. Uh, enough time passed, and now you have total organelles. Okay, they lost their ability to kind of live on their own. They just became kind of established structures within what will become the eukaryotic cell and are free living kind of, you know, just a, a normal part of a eukaryotic cell going forward. So what is the evidence uh, that suggests this theory is true? Well, mitochondria and chloroplasts both resemble bacteria, current bacteria, in size and shape. Obviously, we know that eukaryotic cells are much, much larger than bacteria are. And so if we go, you know, um, not to scale, but if we were to compare a eukaryotic cell to a prokaryotic cell, if a eukaryotic cell is this big with a mitochondria inside, the mitochondria is actually, even to this day, very similar to the size and shape of a current bacteria cell. Why is that significant? That suggests that it could have originated from a free-living prokaryote that would have come in uh, via endocytosis and then became kind of an integral part of these current eukaryotic cells. Uh, again, both mitochondria and chloroplasts resemble the same shape and size of current bacteria. They are both two membranes or both contain two membranes. And what's even more important about the fact that they have two membranes is that both of the membranes actually differ in their chemistry and in their biochemistry and in their composition. Why is that important? The outer membrane actually resembles the structure of a eukaryotic membrane, and the inner membrane resembles that of a prokaryote in structure. If this structure, meaning the mitochondria and chloroplasts, were not once free-living prokaryotes, why would they have a membrane that resembles prokaryotes? To me, and to scientists, and to researchers, and to biologists, it makes sense that if a bacteria pinched its way in by endocytosis, it should have an inner membrane that resembles a prokaryote, and it should have an outer membrane which resembles the eukaryote, okay? Because the eukaryote membrane would have engulfed and surrounded the inner prokaryote membrane when that prokaryote was brought in by endocytosis. Mitochondria and chloroplasts actually have their own DNA, 
And to make that even more interesting, not only do they have their own DNA, which is indicative of a cell that was once free living, that had its own DNA before, that pinched in, obviously bringing its own DNA with it, but that DNA is circular, meaning it's a circular chromosome, and it's naked. Okay, where have we talked about naked DNA before? When we looked through and discussed prokaryotic internal structuring, we talked about the fact that prokaryote chromosomes, okay, the DNA associated with prokaryotic cells, are circular and they are naked, meaning there are no histone proteins associated with this ring of DNA. Both of those things, the fact that this, the DNA inside of a mitochondrion chloroplast is circular and naked, uh, is indicative of the fact that it could have been in a prokaryote prior to uh, the origin of a eukaryote. Eukaryotic DNA obviously is long stringy strands of DNA. It is a linear chromosome, and that DNA, or that chromatin, uh, is associated with histone proteins. Okay? They reproduce. Both mitochondria and chloroplasts are going to reproduce independently of the host cell, meaning it is the only organelle, or they are the only organelles, that will actually replicate themselves. Okay? Um, the Golgi apparatus will not replicate itself. ER, not replicate itself. The nucleus will not replicate itself, other than the fact that the cell can replicate the nucleus prior to cell division. Mitochondria and chloroplasts can actually replicate themselves. Okay, They are self-replicating. So if you are working out a lot or if you're running a lot, you will actually produce more mitochondria per cell in your muscle cells, which give rise to more endurance. Um, Plants that, that have a lot of sun demand or a lot of energy demand can actually replicate or self-replicate their chloroplasts to give rise to more photosynthetic capabilities. Again, mitochondria and chloroplasts can replicate themselves. Both the mitochondria and chloroplasts have or possess 70S ribosomes. And again, why is that significant? If you recall, 70S ribosomes is the prokaryotic ribosome size. Eukaryotes uh, have 80S ribosomes. So why does a eukaryote organelle need to have 70S ribosomes if they weren't prior prokaryotes? Not only did they bring in their prokaryotic circular DNA that is naked, they brought in their uh, prokaryote ribosomes, which are going to give rise to protein synthesis, which is also a piece of evidence. Mitochondria and chloroplasts not only are self-replicating, but they actually can uh, do all of their own protein synthesis. Uh, which means to create their own proteins, and the, the mechanism by which the mitochondria and chloroplasts do protein synthesis is actually very resemblant of the way prokaryotes do it, okay? The mitochondria, even though it's inside of a eukaryote cell, will actually be more resemblant of a prokaryote protein synthesis than it is even a eukaryote uh, protein synthesis, okay? And uh, to round it all out, okay, the mitochondria and chloroplasts is actually susceptible, just like bacteria are, to antibiotics. Meaning, when you take antibiotics, when you're sick, antibiotics are compounds that, that kill bacteria cells because some antibiotics uh, inhibit prokaryote protein synthesis. Why would we want to inhibit protein synthesis? Well, if we can... Uh, inhibit protein synthesis, we can actually stop the mitochondria or we can stop the prokaryotes or the, the bacteria from producing proteins and that ultimately will kill the bacteria, meaning it will um, make us healthy or, or cure us from the infection. Well, it doesn't have any effect on eukaryote protein synthesis, which is why antibiotics don't hurt your host cells, okay, like your internal tissue cells. They only hurt the prokaryotes that are making you sick. Some antibiotics can actually kill your uh, eukaryote mitochondria because they inhibit protein synthesis uh, only in prokaryotes. But because uh, mitochondria in your eukaryote cells use the same mechanisms uh, for protein synthesis that prokaryotes do, the antibiotics can kill uh, or harm the mitochondria within your cell. Okay, All of these things are pieces of evidence. They help to explain the endosymbiotic theory. At this point, we don't have any other evidence to really suggest uh, anything else. This is kind of the standard or, or the way in which we believe prokaryotes kind of gave rise to eukaryotes. Once eukaryotes evolved 2.5 billion years ago, it obviously gave rise to a whole host of multicellular 
uh, and complex organisms, which obviously flood the planet today, including giving rise to humans. Um, but that's all we're going to talk about for today. Okay, if you have questions, bring them to class. See ya.